himself. She was busy doing what she was doing, not knowing what was going to be going on. He was simply sending feelings of appreciation, gratitude, and love to her. And the same thing. At the same time, their hearts began in training and falling into the same rhythm, even though she was unaware and actually just socializing. We've seen the same thing in experiments with plants, where a part of a plant is removed and one part is impacted and one other part in another city responds and dogs. And so we're now into quantum healing. We're into quantum consciousness. And you, are, you took this and you have created something that appears to me to be extremely efficient and elegant. How did you get to that part after going through the resonance uh, studies and such? It was recognition that if these props that we were using for different methods of energetic medicine were just that, if they were props, representations of meaning and significance, then those were really limiting factors. Uh, they might be helpful up to a certain point, but there was a point at which uh, they limited us. That is, uh, any particular radionic vial that we would use would have a particular meaning. Um, any particular gesture that was used in some energetic medicine protocol would have a particular meaning. Um, any particular point on the body that was used as a representation in the course of a physical medicine uh, modality would have some particular meaning. And so it occurred to me that if we use a language structure, a semantic structure to convey meaning and to query, to question the mind-body for, uh, to identify the nature of the problems that were causing illness, that it gave us much more latitude and much more flexibility and much more power because language is the strongest and most powerful metaphorical system that humans have ever mm -hmm. built. Mm -hmm. So it gives us much more uh, ability to identify what's going on in the body. Yeah, no, you're not talking into the busy conscious mind either. I've seen NMT in action. Yes. And there's often, it almost seems like the practitioner is almost speaking under their breath to the body directly. Exactly. So the person can zone out and you don't have to be aware of what's going on at all. So we're talking about the the real mind-body connection, not the conscious chattering mind-body connection. That's exactly right. <laughs> because the conscious mind doesn't control the body. You know, as we're having this conversation, your liver is doing different things, your heart is doing different things, your digestive system are doing different things, but you're not thinking of that at all with your conscious mind. And yet, those are all functions that have to be regulated moment by moment by moment in a very accurate way. So again, going back to the iceberg mm -hmm. metaphor, uh, the 10% <clears throat> is that 10% that you and I are using to have this conversation, but the 90% is the, um, the much larger portion of our nervous system that uh, is regulating the body. So as we perform NMT, what, what you would see is that the practitioner would select a particular uh, clinical pathway appropriate to whatever the problems were that the patient was having. And the practitioner would typically verbally deliver the query statements and the corrective statements. Uh, the reason that that's done, uh, there are a couple of reasons really. One is that I think it's a good thing for the patient to recognize on a conscious mind what the nature of the interaction is that we're having, what the subject matter is and what we're trying to accomplish. But the correction that we're trying to make doesn't happen at a conscious level. And the proof of that <clears throat> is that this process can all be done silently. That is, instead of verbalizing, the practitioner can just bring to mind these query statements and command statements uh, and muscle test. We use muscle testing as uh, a way of getting a response from this other than conscious portion of the nervous system and can go through the whole protocol in a silent way and get the same response. We can also use this uh, protocol with animals who obviously don't understand on a conscious level um, much at all, mm -hmm. uh, we can use it with infants who haven't yet learned yet language. And we can also use it with subject that, subjects that speak a, a language other than the language of the practitioner. And you have an interesting little device. I don't know if you created the device, for, but certainly utilize the little a disk device 
that helps almost through a kinesiological type of response friction to be able to relay that information quickly and accurately from the bioresonance field back to the practitioner so they'll know exactly where to go next in their line of inquiry. Right. It's very interesting. It is very interesting. And you're talking about a, a, a resonance uh, membrane that's used mm -hmm. uh, by some of our practitioners, mm -hmm. not all. And it's a substitute for muscle testing. Right. I was going to get to applied kinesiology and all this. Maybe you can just launch into how this fits into it. Sure, sure. The idea of this is that our conscious mind is the only portion of the nervous system that controls speech and maybe a lucky thing. But the other than conscious mind controls all kinds of parameters of body function. And among those things that uh, it controls is the ability to transmit motor signals to muscles. So as we do muscle testing with a patient, we'll ask them to uh, perhaps hold an arm up, maybe we'll use a shoulder muscle, and ask them to resist with a certain amount of effort, maybe the effort that it would take to hold up three or four pounds. Mm -hmm and to always be consistent with that level of effort so that as we muscle test, we notice some difference in their uh, strength. If their neck is straining, you know they're <laughs> trying too hard. We know they're trying too hard, <laughs> that's right. So if there's a change then, uh, all things being equal, they're using the same level of effort. If there's a change in the resistance that we feel in the muscle, we can use that as a response to our query. In other words, if it's our intention as we interact on this uh, kinesiological level, muscle testing level, uh, that a strong test is an affirmative response, an agreement, and a weak test is a negative response or a disagreement with our statement or our query, then we can have a conversation that will proceed based on strong and weak responses from the particular mm -hmm. test muscle that we use. Now, similarly, we can use galvanic skin response because the other than conscious portion of the nervous system controls the sweating response of the skin. So we can use devices that measure the conductivity of the skin, which fluctuates uh, instantaneously then as we ask these questions and as the other than conscious nervous system uh, gives us an affirmative or a negative response. Mm -hmm. And that, that's also the basis of going now into biofeedback as well. So how, how, so now let's talk about what a dialogue is like between you and a body. Um, if you can do that in a really simplistic manner, how you might begin a line of inquiry, say someone says, oh, my back's really hurting, I think my kidneys are off, and blah, 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 okay? Let's start from something like that. Sure. So if I had a subject in front of me with a, a back problem, uh, I would select a particular pathway. Um, typically it would be what we call the sensory motor pathway. And in working with that patient, I would first look at uh, what we call the tagging of afferent stimuli. That is, how is, how are the signals that come from the muscles and the joints and the connective tissues being interpreted? Is a stretch signal being misinterpreted as a pain signal? We would identify those errors that uh, happen in the attachment of meaning to these sensory signals that come to the brain. The yeah, that's step, important because a lot of times a person thinks it's pain when it's just different. That's right. right. That's right. Pain is an interpretation. Right. You know, we might think, well, I have pain in my back, but the fact is you only have pain in the brain. Uh-huh. It's, right. the, it's the only p place that, that <laughs> pain right. is, is acknowledged or recognized. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a process of cognition, recognition. Um, the next step that we look at is the status of sensory end organs. So kind of like a thermostat in the house, it can be set at a low level or a high level. And similarly, a uh, sensory end organ can be set at a low or a high level. So for instance, the pressure sensors in the eye are set at a fairly low level. It doesn't take much pressure on the eye before we withdraw from that pressure because it's a sensitive area. On the other hand, the sensors on the bottom of the feet are able to take quite a bit of pressure. And you can imagine what kind of a problem you'd have if those sensitivities were switched. Mm -hmm. You can't walk. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't walk and right. your, your eye would be vulnerable to all kinds oh, gosh, of problems, yes. wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. So, 
we look at you things. You can take a poke in the eye with a sharp stick and get through it okay. <laughs>